We're at the grave of Baz Shaw, just inside of Tennessee on the border with North Carolina, because I want to tell his story. This is a story of family feuding, of Union and Confederate, of partisan and bushwhacker, and of roving gangs of murderers who wandered the Appalachian Mountains throughout the 1860s. It's very sad that this grave is now so forgotten. It's on Bass Shaw Gap. You can see his pile of stones here underneath this tree that's fallen over and his grave over here. And to gain a little bit of an idea about how the family feud started, understand that the Shaw family was very pro-Union, as was most of Eastern Tennessee, because the poverty ran so rampant that nobody really supported a cause that they viewed supposedly as one run by a bunch of Southern slave owners. But what made things complicated was the fact that he was the uncle by marriage, at least according to legend, of John Jack Kirtland, who becomes quite infamous in this part of Appalachia's history. I mentioned earlier in the video that most of Eastern Tennessee was pro-Union. In fact, some counties voted at over 95% against secession. Now, because of this, most of Shaw's boys went off to join the Union military, and Kirtland decided to become a lieutenant in the Confederate Army. And his grist mill along the Turkey Creek and Teleco Plains was one of the first to be burned. He decided at that moment to quit his commission as a lieutenant, but keep functioning as one in the mountains, leading a band of bushwhackers who would go and settle personal scores first and fight for the Confederacy second. And it was in that capacity that two of Bass Shaw's sons were killed by the Kirtland Bushwhackers. By that point, he was known as Bushwhacking Jack. It was only years after the end of the Civil War that many of these murders became incorporated into larger narratives of Confederate versus Union, of a guerrilla versus partisan. In reality, a lot of these were murder for the sake of personal gain. Yes, there were people like Kirtland himself who had a bit of a personal vendetta to solve, but most of these guys were AWOL from either Confederate or Union Army and would mingle side by side in their criminal activities. And nowhere is that more obvious than in the September 2nd murder of Bob Stratton. See, Bob was a Confederate soldier, and he was apparently a pretty good one. He'd been wounded in the Battle of Nashville and had brought back with him a very appealing-looking Spencer repeating rifle. Now, those rifles could fire much faster, and they had rifled barrels, which made it important for the Kirtland Raiders to take. And they saw him at a local shop in Teleco and decided at that moment to spring a trap. They ran up ahead of him, and at a fork in the road, they got an ambush together and put a paper down with something written on it. When Bob bent down to pick it up, he was shot at from both sides of the valley, and he fell dead. Well, Jack Roberts, his best friend, crawled into the bushes, and the gang wasn't really concerned with him because he didn't have the rifle. They pilfered the rifle, and Jack Roberts crawled his way back to Teleco to tell everybody that they'd been killed by the Kirtland Bushwhackers. The Stratton family formed an incredibly influential clan here in western North Carolina because they were the descendants of very early settlers. Only a month after the death of Bob Stratton, his 16-year-old son was likewise killed by a captain, and his wife died here, a widow, in the 1880s. When she died, she made sure to put that both her husband and her son were killed. And you can naturally see how something written on a gravestone like this could cause a bit of a stir in the local community. This is how Appalachia's post-war family feuds really began. Bob Stratton isn't buried here. He's buried about 100 yards away from where he was bushwhacked on the side of a hill not far away in Teleco Plains. But you can see elsewhere in the cemetery there are Confederate graves because Bob Stratton was himself a Confederate. There's one in front of me, but like many cemeteries in Appalachia, there are also Union graves in the back of the cemetery. Now, after killing two of a man's sons, I would expect nothing less than for him to join a partisan unit on the opposite side. And sure enough, Baz Shaw joined forces with Captain Tim Lyons and decided to start roving the countryside looking for Kirtland's raiders and killing any Confederate sympathizer they could find. Pretty soon, they tracked down his brother and killed him. It was a Kirtland boy. And we have here some Kirkland graves, including the grave of the brother of Bushwhacker Jack, Jesse Kirkland. Now, the legend goes that he was killed by Bass Shaw in the Civil War, but it looks like he died and was buried in 1895. And you'll find weird discrepancies like this all the time with these stories of mountain partisans and bushwhackers, stories that say they died in the 1860s, but they lived for decades beyond the war.
And I suppose the ambushing death of Jesse Kirkland at the hands of Union Raiders made for a good story, whether or not it happened, to explain why Bass Shaw was almost certainly executed by the Kirkland Raiders. Remember how we visited the grave of Bob Stratton and found that his 16 or 17 year old son John had been killed by Tim Lyons? Well, what's so darkly tragic about that is that Narcissus, the wife of the senior Stratton, lost not only her husband to Confederate bushwhackers, but her young son only a month later to Union bushwhackers and Tim Lyons. By December 1864, everybody saw the war was coming to an end, and these Shaw and Kirtland gangs had shed much blood in these rolling mountains. And it was on December 7th of 1864 that the Kirtland gang decided to rob a general store. And they were coming through this local area when they encountered a Union convoy with a couple of local leaders, officers, Bass Shaw and Joe Barry Shaw, who was Bass Shaw's 17-year-old son. They engaged the party and apparently killed all but one person. And that's probably Joe Barry Shaw because legend says they let him go because he was just a boy. They took Bass Shaw as a prisoner and went to go bring him back to North Carolina. But somehow along the way, he ended up buried in an unmarked grave at this gap. They said that he tried to make an escape, but I think he was executed. After all, he killed the leader of that gang's brother. And on top of this hill is the grave of Bayes Shaw's wife, Rebecca Shaw. Now you can see here on her grave that she proudly listed herself as the wife of B. Shaw, but she probably didn't want to write down Bayes Shaw because it was still a heated time at that point when she died in the 1890s. And if you take a look over here, you'll see a little bit more about why it was so heated. I mentioned this is how the feuds started. Well, she was a Kirkland girl, and you can see other Kirklands who were buried in the same cemetery, including Enos Kirkland. And down here to the left, you've got Confederate graves. But further left, you've got Union graves. So you can see how feuds really flared up in this part of the country. And I think it's fascinating. I was recommended a book about the Hatfield and McCoy feud that's written from the perspective of some of the women because there was often marriage between the families. You can only imagine Rebecca Shaw's thoughts as her cousins were killed on the Confederate side and her sons were killed on the Union side. Legend says that only one person survived that ambush on December 7th, 1865, and that was 17-year-old J.B. Shaw who was let go because he was too young. He was the son of Bayes Shaw, and you can see here he married J.C. Shaw. Both of them lived until the 1920s and 30s, but this is five minutes up the road from his mother. And if you take a look around, there's many Kirklands in this cemetery. And on the right there is J.B. Shaw, Bayes Shaw's young son. If you pan over here, I wonder, the men fighting for Kirkland and for Bayes Shaw, if they knew that it was a family feud more so than a civil war feud between Confederate and Union. Because here you see the Kirklands, more Kirklands, and over here you see the Shaws. After two of Bass Shaw's sons were killed by Kirkland's bushwhackers, he began joining forces with the Laney Gang, and this gang was led by a Union partisan named Randolph Laney. And in this area of the foothills of the Appalachia Mountains in Murphy, North Carolina, the Laney clan is very strong, and buried here is the wife of Randolph Laney. Randolph has no known grave because he was killed in that ambush on December 7th, 1864, but his wife was buried here. Most sources I can find online say that final ambush on December 7th actually captured Bass Shaw and killed Randolph Laney. Now, what I find on Ancestry.com is that he died on December 7th, which would imply that he was possibly wounded, escaped, and died to be buried somewhere in the valley. But this is his wife, Dorcas Ann Laney. And one source I can find online claims that that December 7th ambush in 1864 was on seven people, of which only one escaped. But most sources say that the 17-year-old son of Bass Shaw was allowed to leave by Kirkland's bushwhackers. And you can see in this cemetery where Randolph Laney's wife is buried that the Laney family to this day is very strong in inland North Carolina. And some of the graves here in Murphy, North Carolina are unknown, but I haven't been able to find too many of them. This is just overlooking the Baptist Church.
And who knows what happened to Randolph Laney, the commander of the Union partisan group, the Laney Gang. At least common legend says that he escaped that ambush along with another commander, but his death record lists December 7th, 1864. Perhaps he made his way off and died in the woods of his wounds. Maybe he was executed and the Kirkland Rangers didn't tell anybody about it. And maybe he just pulled a vanishing act and was never seen again. In any case, if he died, he probably would have been given a proper burial because that was very important to families in the local area, especially with the end of the Civil War being only months away. We're here at the grave of John Kirkland, or Bushwhacker Jack. Now, in legend, the family conflict is said to have started because Base Shaw's wife was the sister of Bushwhacker Jack's mother. In reality, Base Shaw seems to have married into the Kirkland family, and specifically into the line that most mattered to men like John Jack. That's because his wife, Rebecca's father, was James Kirkland, who fancied himself Indian royalty. That obscure family legend goes on to say that Nathaniel Kirkland, the grandfather of Base Shaw's wife, became known as Chief Cheese Choir and ruled over this part of the Tennessee North Carolina border with his wife, Lily Faw, the princess. The Kirkland family had little real title to anything, but they were some of the earliest settlers, and so by the time the rest of the area was settled, they owned the general stores and the ferries. And along comes Base Shaw, a union man who stands in opposition to everything an illustrious officer like John Jack Kirkland could hope to represent. When he married into the line of descendants directly related to Chief Nathan Cheese Choir, there were tense relations, but things really bubbled over when Lieutenant Kirkland's general store was burned down by union guerrillas, something that Base Shaw vehemently supported. And nothing ever really befell Lieutenant Kirkland. He was never brought into court, he was never accused of murder in front of a jury, and he lived the rest of his life, dying here in 1902, an older man. And I have to say one last time that although I don't believe this legend, much like I don't fully believe the legend of the Troxels or Princess Corn Blossom, the fact remains that in the early 1800s, the legend was around, and if people believed it back then, then it would be believed up until the Civil War and for decades after, and it entitled the Kirkland family to some degree of public respect, whether or not that was an official historic event, or whether they had fabricated it for a little bit of local fame.